Hello, everyone. This is Elisa Baum. I'm Grid Gain Systems Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I need to conduct just a little bit of housekeeping. First, could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? Let's uh, see here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next, during this webinar, you will be unmute, but should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the discussion, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Grid Gain Systems blog. In addition, I'll make sure that each of you has a link to the recording and the slides within 48 hours. With that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, um, Empowering FinTech with In-Memory Computing. It's being jointly presented today by Eric Cartman, who is a financial services industry consultant, and by Matt Sorrell, who is Grid Gain Systems Technical Director. And with that said, I will turn the floor over to Eric. He'll be starting today, and we'll be going back and forth. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I know that we have participants from all parts of the world joining us, and I appreciate that you're coming back to us for the next uh, round in our series on uh, where grid gain and memory data fabric helps uh, various types of financial companies to reach their potentials. And today we'll talk about a very interesting topic, which is a fintech and how fintech companies are, or fintech uh, um, approaches actually use in-memory computing um, successfully. And this is the first time that we'll be doing this together with Matt, who is a director of technical marketing at GridGain. And uh, actually, it's interesting that this topic is called fintech, and I will represent the finance part of this, and he'll represent the technology part of this. But oh, together, we'll, uh, we'll cover <laughs> both areas quite well, I believe. That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, what about fintech? I think fintech is a new disruptive combination of technology and finance. And this is uh, one area that every bank, every financial institution talks about when I, when I meet with them, when I do work with them. This is the first thing that comes onto their mind, that there's a new company that, or new technology they're trying to implement that's coming externally. Banks stop um, developing too many applications themselves. They're moving, the, the clearest trend is to actually um, move, you know, move out a big technology organization from within the bank and let somebody else who is just specializing in technology to uh, design and develop uh, certain tools that would help financial companies uh, to succeed. That's one trend I'm clearly seeing, but also um, the actual fintech companies are trying to also disrupt the business sometimes and take certain functions out from traditional financial institutions and uh, offer them directly to the public. Those are the two biggest uh, areas that I think I'm seeing within the fintech today. Uh, the industry itself has been uh, growing significantly. There's been a lot of investment in fintech. It's soared in the past several years. Uh, the numbers I have here that it, it's gotten, it's grown from 1.8 billion in 2010 to more than 19 billion in 2015. And as you can imagine, 2016 probably so even a larger uh, investment. So I would say, you know, it's about grow, growing about 100% year after year uh, is a significant uh, growth industry here. And why is this, is this happening? Why is it growing so fast? Well, I believe several reasons uh, are behind this. One is that uh, obviously it's easier to do trade globally now and uh, you can start your technology business anywhere in the world and find customers anywhere else in the world. So the internet and uh, collaborative uh, technologies, ease of communications uh, electronically, all of this obviously helps as well as the uh, legal framework that also helps to protect uh, intellectual property, pr pr uh, protect uh, client data, protect uh, some of the other um, issues that usually that have hasn't uh, that has been considered uh, have been considered uh, sort of um, uh, block points uh, before in in growing this area. 
The second area is the startup culture, right? So we know and this is a global trend again, that it's easy to start a new business. It's easy to, you know, if you have an idea, it's easy to implement it. There is financing that's available to do so. And, uh, you know, everybody is moving into that area, hoping that they will become the next Google, next Microsoft, and starting those uh, ve uh, ventures uh, in various areas, including financial uh, industry. Uh, tax savvy generation, obviously, uh, both uh, consumers as well as the providers of this technology expect smart machines, expect technology, expect automation. And, uh, and that's what uh, is being created within the fintech uh, industry. Uh, the barrier, barriers, to, uh, barriers to, uh, to entry and cost of entry had also been reduced because, again, all you need is a, is a garage and a couple of uh, people to actually develop something and create a prototype and show it to others and start implementing. So again, the technology is becoming cheaper, and uh, uh, it's e you know it's easier to um, offer this uh, technology and offer ideas to others. Lower transactional cost. Well, it's also because of uh, our main technology innovations and technology dependency that uh, and technology is becoming cheaper. So obviously, the overall costs uh, are, are reducing as well. Uh, there's also increased competition. Um, and that's good and bad at the same time. I mean, obviously, it's good that we have uh, a lot of ideas, uh, you know, uh, circulated, and uh, each idea can have a, a you know, tool or technology built behind this. But also, it means that you have to be better than others and keep constantly improving your technology. And if the consumer dissatisfaction affects you, then that means uh, death to your idea, because obviously there are already a couple of other people uh, with similar ideas that may be more successful with consumers than you are. Uh, the technology by itself is more affordable and uh, you know can, can be used by consumers directly. And innovation is definitely there to actually provide services that the consumers need and in many cases consumers demand what services they want and then technology companies quickly adapt to that uh, also seeing open source software and open source packages available uh, to help fintech companies to quickly build software without uh, significant expenses uh, and then we also have analytics and big data uh, also growing in this area. So you can take a lot of data that's already available. You can buy the data, you can collect the data, sometimes very cheaply from social media, from other sources and use them and analyze them and produce results that you think will be um, useful in helping you uh, with, with um, competition. Uh, and the regulations uh, also there, and obviously regulations within financial industries uh, have been you know, have been important. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, companies, all, fintech companies, also help in many cases uh, financial companies to overcome certain regulations uh, issues because they you know they built uh, tools specific to regulations initiatives they follow the regulation the regulators and what they're coming up with so they're ahead of time and as the regulations keep shifting you know with the new administration with uh, new ideas uh, quickly you know being able to change uh, your interface to change your uh, actions of the product based on changes in regulations is again something that fintech uh, can do very effectively. And then uh, we'll talk more about cloud computing and outsourcing, uh, you know, and that's, I think, another big area because you can do things faster, you can, you can process data faster, you can analyze uh, and transact faster. Uh, that's definitely one of the growing factors here. And outsourcing, them, like I said before, you don't have to, if you're a financial firm, if you are even a technology firm, you don't have to build all of the computing uh, that you need and all of the logic that you need internally. You can decide what is your core specialization and everything else you let somebody else handle, which is cheaper and uh, provides you more expertise in doing so because you are relying on somebody who is doing this uh, day in, day out. Uh, as I, like I said, you know, this is the area where a lot of investments are coming. 
uh, lots of private equity firms, uh, venture capitalists, uh, they are looking for new ideas and they're putting a lot of money into this. So here I just took a, um, a slide from Venture Scanner uh, site, you know, that shows uh, what the average funding is like in each of the area within FinTech. As you can see, uh, some of the largest uh, areas where this goes into are consumer lending, consumer payments, payments backend, lending. So basically, as you can see, the theme here is lending, payments, uh, digital banking, consumer-oriented uh, finance. Um, the top fintech trends, uh, to summarize, uh, based on the previous two slides, you know, I think we we are clearly, you know, clearly seeing four trends that are showing here. One is banking and payments, um, where obviously it's consumer oriented finance with twenty four seven availability, digital banks, uh, payments uh, based on blockchains and bitcoins, uh, social media hookups, uh, Internet of Things, biometrics, uh, contactless spending. This is a, a big area. Lots of ideas uh, have been uh, circulated in this area from the fintech industry. Uh, also investments in trade automation where uh, companies as well as individuals are relying more on um, sort of algorithmic and analytical advice, computing advice that they can get instead of relying on uh, uh, a particular financial advisor that they're using. So relying more on data analysis, relying more on analysis of the market and deciding which uh, uh, strategy to utilize based on a quick scanning of the markets and and, and what's happening, uh, any news and any other ideas that circulate within the market. Uh, lending is also becoming bigger with peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding and all kinds of alternative lending options, where again, this is a disruption to uh, traditional financial firm models where you know people can participate directly into the lending business uh, by being the you know using the open platforms or using computing platforms to provide uh, lending opportunities cheaper than you would have to you know you would get from going to the more traditional financial institutions and insurance is another area where a lot of uh, trends are coming into that uh, uh, the insurers now because of uh, internet of things because of uh, uh, better analytics that's available to them. They can get uh, quicker results. They can uh, customize policies based on an individual situation of a, uh, of a household or a person that's applying for insurance and not doesn't have don't have to put him in brackets. Uh, they can analyze a lot about that individual, where they travel, how long they've traveled, you know, where they where they go to visit, what type of lifestyle they lead. All of this can be available by going through social uh, social media, by going through um, some of the other data that may be available uh, from uh, from the consumers from consumers directly to the insurance companies. However, there are still challenges, and the challenges uh, that we need to overcome in this industry is, uh, well, there's still some, some, somewhat global uncertainty, right? We've seen changes in governments and moving from global to isolation in, in certain cases and how that's going to affect uh, things and how, you know, the country wants to just depend on their own innovations and uh, try to stay away from global innovation. So this is something that we may need to follow cl uh, closely, but this is one uncertainty that I would say is there. Uh, also customer acquisitions, because these are new firms. And one of their biggest challenges is really to find customers. You know, if I know a bank, I know a name uh, that I've been shopping with and using for two or three generations, that's one thing. Now, if it's an online uh, application offering to take my money and to invest them or to provide me other services, I may be somewhat uh, reluctant in uh, joining them quickly. Uh, right, you know, that also leads us to reputational risk. And obviously, if there is a failure of some sort with the bank, maybe it's not, you know, with that, with that online service or that, with that uh, fintech uh, 
provider, then that be that becomes a reputational risk if I cannot access uh, uh, services or there's some kind of other failure within the, within that um, uh, virtual uh, firm. Uh, culture change uh, again because you know maybe younger generation is quite adept in using uh, those. Uh, uh, fintech approaches, fully uh, electronic uh, access points. Uh, you know, previous generations may not be um, available. We not may not easily adapt to this. Uh, also, obviously, you know, those as, as as we mentioned, those firms are uh, you know limited in uh, cash and investments. So obviously, they operate within usually strict cash. Uh, uh, conservancy models, and that uh, may also lead to some challenges that they have to overcome to compete with uh, banks that may have more cash reserves on their books. And there, like I said before, regulations still there, still uh, you know, uh, still apply similarly to both fintech and uh, traditional firms. And fintech firms have to now, be, you know, invest into. Uh, legal and compliance departments invest into understanding regulations and, uh, and applying for certain practices uh, that they did, may might have not uh, had to worry about before. And then uh, difficulty gaining business to business segment, as we saw in the previous slides, there's much more um, sort of proliferation of fintech industry on uh, B2C. Uh, segment um, and not as much with B2B, which is still more traditional in nature. Um, there are also limitations of legacy technology that sometimes, uh, you know, there is certain technology that's already there and has to be replaced. And uh, in order for you to come up with an idea, you have to also replace technology uh, because you won't be able to maybe uh, use uh, bit, you know, bitcoins, blockchains, and some other things using your legacy technology. And the security concerns, right? So you also have to invest into security as uh, you're dealing now with customer data, you're dealing with uh, payments and financial transactions, so you have to secure uh, that infrastructure. And then lack of technology resources, right? So we hear that, that in, you know, in those various centers where uh, fintech uh, ideas are floating, like, you know, California, New York, uh, a few other areas, uh, you know, there is a significant shortage of technology resources that can quickly uh, join those firms and bring their products to the next level. Uh, another trend that I'm seeing um, is the fintech collaboration. So instead of fighting uh, the disruption that fintech um, firms bring onto the financial community, many financial firms are trying to work together with fintech companies. And uh, it's basically what the slide shows. But uh, you know, I, I, as I am working with many large financial institutions, I am seeing that they are now. Uh, investing more, you know, they're directly into into, fin into fintech companies. They're bringing their uh, products uh, into their, you know, in, in, into them. They're signing agreements with them that they wouldn't compete with each other. So that there are all kinds of uh, cooperation uh, channels that open up between financial firms and uh, fintechs that they believe may disrupt their business. Um, on the technology trends, um, that as we said earlier, that uh, I believe um, with technology trends, you also have um, um, a difference of why fintech is growing so much. I mean, I already mentioned open source, but also you know the data and predictive analytics and algorithmic trading and stability of the system and security and scalability and distributed systems and all kinds of other uh, cloud computing and all kinds of other technology trends are clearly uh, uh, pushing this industry to grow faster. Uh, let me talk a little bit about in-memory computing because uh, you know we are uh, an in-memory firm and I wanted to explain where in-memory plays a role here. And why in memory now? Well, first of all, that's another trend that I'm clearly seeing uh, that within memory, you obviously can do uh, similar transactions much faster than you could do before. And uh, especially for fintech firms where you have to bring a lot of 
uh, data in. You you know you are trying to load your computers up to uh, you know, up to, up to a level that you are competing with some of the traditional business. You have to have technology that's very fast, and that's where in memory helps. Uh, while the cost of memory has been dropping significantly, and uh, uh, we can now afford to build those firms can afford to build larger systems that can transact with uh much faster uh with practically no uh price uh burden significant improvement uh, significant increases in prices uh, here we have slides that shows that the cost of memory dropping and it's um, dropping about 30 percent every 12 months and now we are slightly higher than the disk but to the performance that we get which are like thousands times faster uh, you know significantly uh, covers I think the cost that that's slight cost increase versus traditional disks um, uh, why in memory now? Um, uh, sorry, but the wrong direction. Um, so in memory computing technology market is big and growing rapidly. And, uh, you know, one of the reason is, you know, that uh, growth in fintech, right? So with those fintech companies, they're coming, they're looking to, okay, what's available? What's the fastest technology available there that it's not very expensive, but at the same time can offer skill, uh, scalability, can offer high performance, um, and and obviously, you know, in memory computing is something that they're looking at uh, all the time. And this is uh, a market that's growing, as you can see, growing had been growing also very, very, very fast within the next couple within the past couple of years. Um, so the evolution of in memory grid computing, um, it's the moving from disk to 100 percent in memory. Uh, leverage clustered memory and parallel distributed processing for faster results. As, as I said, you have about 1,000 times faster performance while uh, uh, the ROI is improving and uh, uh, spent is, uh, is limited. And uh, now I think what I'd like to do is I would like to turn this the floor over to Matt um, to cover somewhat the in memory uh, the grid gains and memory computing platform and then uh, I'll pick it up after that to talk a, uh, you know a little bit about some of the use cases that we've done with fintech companies Alisa can you please uh, redirect to Matt Matt I she think had. yeah okay oh, thank you mm -hmm. I'm I'm a little slow on the uptake <laughs> okay <laughs> great uh, hopefully everyone is now seeing the right thing. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> That's always a relief. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about what is an in-memory computing platform. Um, essentially, you know, like Eric mentioned, the, the, the key to an in-memory computing platform is in-memory. And so it's, uh, wait, who's, we're, we're getting, Okay. All right. So there's a an in memory computing platform has the ability to cache data into memory. Um, also the ability to run parallel processing or compute in a distributed fashion. Um, the ability to access the data that's cached in memory uh, using SQL or um, another popular uh, programming language uh, streaming data analysis. Also, um, another key aspect of an in-memory computing platform is that it, it doesn't replace an existing database. It's uh, simply inserted between an existing application and the data layer, uh, which, which resides um, on disk. So the persistent storage will still take place in the existing database. You're, you're adding this in-memory layer uh, to handle the things that need to be super fast, like caching content or um, running ACID compliant transactions. Uh, and because it's super fast, you can not only use it for transactions, but you can also use it for uh, real-time analytics as well. 
um, and a, a good in-memory computing platform will have the ability to work with various backend databases, relational databases, NoSQL databases, or Hadoop, um, and allow you to access them through a, a single API. And uh, you can also deploy this in-memory computing platform anywhere, um, anywhere you've got a cluster of machines that uh, you can manage. So on-premise, in the cloud, um, scale, uh, actually, you know, for example, Grid Gain Enterprise Edition can scale up to 32 different locations, which can be different cloud zones or, you know, a mix of on-premise and in the cloud. Uh, so the, the Grid Gain in-memory computing platform has all those things I just described. It's built on Apache Ignite, it includes a, a data grid um, for data caching. Compute Grid is a, a good place to run distributed compute, like, uh, like real-time analytics. Um, or uh, actually, we just uh, did a, another webinar earlier that was on uh, Bitcoin and blockchain processing. So that's another great use for Compute Grid, uh, SQL Grid. Um, for processing SQL commands. Streaming, I mentioned Service Grid um, is a, a communications layer that uh, the Grid Game computing platform uses. So you can integrate us into a, a service-based architecture and also Hadoop acceleration. And we do all this through uh, advanced clustering features, uh, using an in-memory file system, the messaging, which I mentioned as part of service, event tracking, and uh, data structures, which are, we're basically an in-memory key value store. And let's see, so just so you understand how customers use grid gain, um, we sent a survey out to all our customers last year. I have sliced this survey up so that this is only the answers from fintech. Uh, so it, it turns out that about, mm, let's say, 15 to 20% of our customers are uh, in fintech. Uh, so most important here were high-speed transactions, real-time streaming, um, you know, then uh, database caching, uh, HTAP building a hybrid transaction and analytics platform, uh, and just simply doing application scaling. Uh, so next, what data stores do FinTech customers connect to? Um, oh, this is kind of a funny chart because I would imagine it, it keeps changing as um, markets evolve. But right now, or actually last year, the answers were Cassandra, at the top, uh, Oracle, MySQL, and then there's a drop off to a, a whole bunch of others. Um, so there's a, a NoSQL followed by a couple of a, a bunch of relational answers. And uh, how important were each of the following product features to your organization? Um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Compute Grid is above Data Grid um, in, in a lot of the verticals that we look at, uh, data grid is the number one feature. Um, in FinTech, compute grid is the number one feature. Um, so we've got compute grid, data grid, the in-memory file system, service grid, and uh, we're fully ANSI SQL 99 compliant, which is pretty important, um, followed by streaming grid, then Spark shared RDDs, um, for those of you working in a Hadoop and Spark world, and then support for containers. Um, and then there's a drop off. And this was kind of interesting. Most, most verticals like split where they're running uh, grid gain and ignite, but uh, in FinTech, it's pretty much on premise or AWS or a private cloud, everything else was zero. Um, and 
Oh, languages that people use. Far and away, the leader was SQL, um, followed by Java and C++. Um, again, that's actually kind of interesting because um, C++ is heavy in FinTech. Usually it's lower on the list and you would see PHP and .NET up higher. Okay, and uh, I think at this point I would turn this, Alisa, if you could please change the presenter back to Eric and let's have Eric run us through some uh, use cases. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Yes. I can hear you, but we okay. don't see your slides yet. Right, okay, let me go to the, just the right slides, something slow here. Okay, one second. Okay. Just one second, thank you. Okay, so uh, basically, um, we are uh, you know we are quite well known already in financial services industry, and as well as fintech. And just in this slide, I wanted to show some of the uh, success that we've had with different use cases in uh, financial services. As you can see, yes, we are there with the, with the largest banks. Uh, that are using our tech, you know, our technology to build some of the new technology uh, by themselves to process uh, those, uh, uh, you know, increased number of transactions and, and and provide additional services to their customers. But we also deal with some of the larger fintech companies, uh, like here SSNC, Mysis, Thomson Reuters, Market. Uh, those are well-known uh, firms within the financial technology industry. Uh, so, this case I wanted to introduce to you is Mises. Uh, it's a well-known company, uh, both used both in uh, investment banking services, uh, investment banking world, as well as uh, retail banking world. Um, and they have products that uh, cover uh, risk management, uh, lending, uh, treasury, um, and some of the other uh, financial um, issues and they have about about 2000 customers in 130 countries and used by uh, 48 of the world's 50 largest banks so one of the areas where they had issues uh, was that they wanted to eliminate some of the data processing bottlenecks and they also wanted to build their own um their own uh, cloud based platform to serve uh, um, some of their enterprise clients within the cloud. Uh, and that's where they saw some of the issues uh, with uh, performance, with scalability, with uh, a reporting of transactions. Uh, and they wanted, they, they wanted to utilize our platform. Um, so uh, we've, uh, they're, they're using um, commodity servers from various manufacturers. Uh, and uh, they are utilizing our our platform, our grid computing platform, uh, where they store their transactions, their market data, uh, onto the same uh, cluster, and then they can pro uh, process uh, heavy reporting, heavy analytics against the data within the cluster. Uh, Matt, if if you wanted to add a little bit more to this, uh, you're welcome to. But uh, from what I've heard, that they are, you know, they are utilizing the platform very successfully, and this Fusion Fabric Cloud uh, platform is uh, significantly depending on the technology from Gridgain. As you can see, some of the words here from the director of product management uh, attest to that that uh, Gridgain helped them to uh, improve performance and elim eliminate some of the. Um, bottlenecks that they've experienced before. Right, I think the, mo the most important part um, is this, the, at the end of the quote, enabling us to offer next generation financial services to our customers, right? So they have really used the in-memory technology from grid gain um, to enhance the, the, you know, their FinTech product. Right, right. And that's what we, I'm seeing in uh, many uh, uh, cases where financial firms and financial technology firms are using great gain. Like the case, uh, the next case that I wanted to this from Sberbank, which is the largest bank in Russia and Eastern Europe and the third largest in Europe. Uh, 
And they had similar issues where they were looking to uh, expand further uh, as they were ex expecting more business, uh, as they were as they were seeing significant growth from the transactional uh, um, quantities coming in from all of the non-traditional uh, sources like you know the ATMs and mobiles and internet and uh, online and you know all that stuff you know in a, in addition to their uh, traditional uh, uh, banking business in many branches that they have across uh, Europe um, so as they were as they were looking to build a new generation platform to uh, better alleviate some of the uh, challenges and prepare for the future. Uh, so they've looked at uh, a number of different competitor platforms that operate within the in-memory space. Um, and they had specific requirements about uh, very high level of uh, redundancy and high availability, uh, very, um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, very, very heavy uh, uh, computational power that they would need, and how many transactions would have to be processed uh, simultaneously. Uh, having being able to uh, have a level of financial security that uh, had been required for them uh, by the Russian regulators, which are quite high from the cybersecurity perspective and data law protection perspective. So all of that was in the requirements. And they've, like I said, they've evaluated several platforms and they chose uh, GridGate. And one of the uh, great uh, things that uh, we saw with them was that while they, um, um, when they did a test with our platform, they were able to generate about 1 billion transactions per second, which practically none of the competitors could show any results in similar in a similar range. And they did that test only on 10 Dell R610 blades, uh, providing them with one terabyte of memory, which cost them about $25,000. So as you can see, the, the costs that are spent on a system like that uh, and the results that they're getting uh, are very affordable and uh, better than anything else that uh, exists out there. Um, let's see. And this is uh, this, uh, another quote we have here from Herman Greff, who is a CEO of the Bear Bank, where he basically says similar to what I just said, you know, that they've looked at uh, uh, different platforms because they were looking for a new platform that would enable the bank to introduce new products, to be to stay competitive, to provide a level of uh, performance and reliability that their customers ex would expect. And they've looked at technologies from Oracle, IBM, and some of the other competitors, and they uh, saw that grid gain showed them the best results, uh, best performance that they could achieve. Um, Matt, would you like to pick up from here? Um, Alyssa, okay. uh, can you switch? Thank you. Okay. Now. Okay, Matt, I switched to you. Do you have the pop up? Yes, I do. Okay. Cool. Uh, oh. Um, I have the pop up, and okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay, and thank you, audience, for bearing with us. This is the first time we're doing this switching back and forth thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. How does everyone, how did these customers do this? Um, so I mentioned before about GridGain. Now, GridGain uh, actually developed and released and is the main contributor to Apache Ignite. Um, and Apache Ignite is now the second fastest project to um, graduate to full uh, project status um, on Apache in history, second to Spark. We all know how crazy popular Spark is. Um, Ignite is, is more mature than its uh, two years would, would indicate. Um, when there are over 60 contributors um, and uh, anyway, it's it, we're talking about a million plus lines of code, 
Um, and Gridgain is the primary contributor to Apache Ignite. Um, the reason why I always start with Ignite is that uh, if you just wanted to find out what in-memory computing can do, uh, this is a good, you know, obviously free is a good place to start when you're just kicking the tires. Um, and later you can uh, determine if you need the um, better support or greater scalability and security that, that Gridgain offers. Um, actually, kind of, I, I think I kind of said this. So uh, I'm not going to read my slides to you. OK. And uh, so we talk about Gridgain and Ignite as an in-memory data fabric, which means that all these different things work together. This is actually a major point um, because you will find other in-memory quote unquote solutions that offer bits and pieces of what uh, grid gain and ignite offer, but you won't find anyone else who offers everything that we offer, which is, um, I covered a lot of these before. The data grid, compute grid, uh, service grid, everything works together. It's all managed through a single interface. Um, I'm going to go into more depth on each of these. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about how each one translates into uh, the real world, right? So it's not really just a, a data grid, right? What's important is that you can use it for web session clustering, distributed caching, and use that to build scalable SaaS solutions, which is important in this fintech world. Um, let's see, other things that I'll call out would be uh, using Compute Grid for uh, machine learning, uh, risk and fraud analysis. Um, actually, like also a lot of the like real-time calculations that have to be done to ensure regulatory compliance. Um, SQL Grid is a key feature in adoption, in very quick, rapid adoption, because you don't necessarily have to rewrite all of your code uh, you can just point your application now at uh, the data store that's in grid gain or ignite and uh, continue to leverage the SQL code that's in your application. Um, SQL is also important because it connects to analytics platforms. Um, like we just went through uh, the process of becoming Tableau certified. So now you know you can point Tableau at the data that's saved in grid gain or ignite and run all of your analyses. Uh, Streaming is important, like real-time pricing, uh, real-time news feeds, um, stuff like that. Uh, people who live in Hadoop world tend to enjoy Hadoop acceleration um, because Hadoop can be slow. And this is a, a good way to speed up Hadoop by uh, moving a subset of your Hadoop data into memory and uh, working with it within uh, grid gain or ignite. Um, and event, event processing goes along with uh, streaming. So um, the way that uh, grid gain or ignite is deployed is uh, basically you have your application on the top. Um, that's what all these little clouds and boxes are. And, your application's written in whatever it's written in, and it's hitting the back end, all of these different backends, the SQL, NoSQL, or Hadoop backend. And essentially, you, you just insert the grid gain in memory data fabric uh, in between your application and your uh, persistent data source and achieve the, the greater performance and scale that way. So, using our APIs. Uh, to connect to your applications and different or other APIs to connect to your um, database backend uh, and the connectors that we have. Uh, here's more detail on each. Um, just doing a time check. Elisa, do you think now might be a good time to ask if there are questions? Um, because there might, if people have questions, they might 
In fact, I'm not even going to say, Elisa, do you think? I'm just going to ask. If you have questions, uh, can you raise your hand or type them in the chat window? And uh, Eric and I will do our best to answer your questions. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'm going to uh, continue with the product detail. OK, so the in-memory data grid, I mean, this is really the, the, the most important part of uh, grid gain and ignite. And this is where, you know, the, the real, actually, although in FinTech, I, we saw an uptake in the compute grid, which I have, we'll talk about next. But basically, we're talking about a distributed in-memory key value store. Um, and it basically scales up as you need to scale up. Uh, we handle all of that. You just add a new machine and enroll the IP address into the, the web console, and we handle everything um, for you uh, for greater speed. Um, and also, the, we are um, known for being able to have ACID guarantees on in-memory transactions, which means you now have um, super fast and super consistent uh, transactions, or you, you can use this for transactions rather than just for caching, um, which is an important distinction with grid gain and ignite. Um, and again, you, you can run um, sophisticated uh, SQL, SQL queries uh, against the in data that's in data grid. Um, so SQL grid is, uh, we always had SQL um, connectivity, but we recently really took the SQL connectivity and functionality up, up a notch. Um, so, and we did that by adding full support uh, for SQL and DML commands, um, which is really a distinction for grid gain and ignite. Uh, and the ability to process SQL commands in a distributed fashion. Um, so they're much faster, right? We have this principle of um, pushing the, the operation, whether that's compute or SQL to the data, rather than pulling the data to the machine that's executing the operation. And when you do that, it's actually much faster because if you think about it, to push you know, one or two or 10 or even 50 lines of code as an operation to the data is much faster than pulling however many, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or, you know, billions of rows of data to the, um, to the operation. Um, and let's see, right, as I mentioned before, you just point your application at the grid gain ODBC or JDBC connector and um, your SQL will almost all run. Um, and let's see, in-memory compute grid is an important feature in the FinTech world. Um, this is, enables parallel processing, uh, typically of compute heavy tasks. Uh, so these, and these could be anything from uh, tasks that you write uh, or tasks that are uh, built into grid gain or ignite. Um, and basically we handle all of the, all of the clustering um, and uh, load balancing and fault tolerance that you would need uh, in order to um, run your compute tasks uh, very, very quickly and efficiently. And, um, What's important too is that we use this pluggable SPI design so you can move jobs around uh, depending on where the data is. Um, and actually we also have this web console tool which makes it possible to visualize all this stuff. And um, you'll understand how, like when I say move the compute around or move the SQL around, uh, you can actually see the effect that moving ar around will have on your performance. Um, through web console. Um, let's see. In memory streaming and uh, complex event processing is also a popular. Those are also popular features for the FinTech world. 
Um, basically, I mean, the diagram is worth a thousand words, right? You build, you you connect to your stream. It's it's like very easy. It's, you connect to the your stream. Um, you establish a window, and then you run your uh, analyses on on the streaming data in each window. Um, and let's see. Well, you know what you would use that for your fintech <laughs> real time analysis of uh, I guess typically like pricing and uh, and news feeds. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, in memory Hadoop acceleration, which can be important for a bunch of analytics use cases. Um, and uh, they essentially, uh, you look at kind of slow Hadoop and uh, through what basically amounts to a couple of configuration changes, um, you can insert uh, Ignite or Grid Gain uh, on top of Hadoop between your app and Hadoop. Um, typically, that'll be uh, Spark. That's what we see most, most of the time. And uh, achieve anywhere um, from 2x to 10x faster performance, like just with that configuration change, um, you can actually like dig deeper and uh, get smarter about which data resides in uh, Ignite or Grid Gain and which data stays in Hadoop. And uh, you can actually see um, dramatic performance increases of, you know, 20x or 50x, something like that. Um, and a lot of this is because we use, we can run our own MapReduce in memory on our compute grid. And, uh, and then, you know, perform read through and write through operations on HDFS. And uh, so looking at um, the differences, so understanding uh, Ignite and uh, grid gain. Um, basically, you get uh, better support, you get the management GUI, um, better security, um, the ability to like achieve fault tolerance uh, through multiple data centers, like implementing nodes and actually implementing different clusters in different data centers. Uh, and I already mentioned better support, and you get earlier uh, access to um, releases and patches. Oh, and also, um, you'll get uh, training and, and consulting services from your grid game, which which is good because you'll you'll learn how to really take advantage of the of the platform. And that wraps up uh, today's discussion. Um, about uh, building faster and uh, more scalable fintech solutions. Um, thanks for uh, moderating this, Elisa, and uh, thank you for co-presenting. Eric, I in enjoyed doing this with you. And uh, we, you. we do have a couple of questions from the audience. So I'll go oh, we right. do. Yeah. And I just went right on talking. That's OK. So <laughs> um, let's see. Rather than sitting in front of a database layer, can grid gain sit in front of an SOA layer? Hmm. That, that's a technology question. More, more for you. <laughs> uh, huh. I, wow. That's, uh, I think we're going to have to get back to you on that question. Um, right. So we can, we have uh, support for, uh, a, we can be part of our own service-oriented architecture, um, and we can push messages in and out. Um, so I, I would say yes, but I, I think that we need to follow up with someone more technical than me in order to really get an answer to that. OK, so um, whoever asked the question, I want to say your name. Uh, we will get back to you with an answer on that question. OK, and then the next question is for me. Um, people are asking, will we get a copy of this recording and the slides? And the answer is yes, I just need to process it after this call. Um, are there any other questions? If you do have them, please go ahead and enter them in the 
questions window in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and I want to remind everyone that our financial services webinar series continues monthly. Um, and um, we have several interesting topics planned over the next uh, few months. Um, Eric and Matt will be returning um, in May, on May 3rd, for um, if you're in the insurance industry, um, having a, a discussion about insurance applications and modernizing them within memory computing. Um, and then we also have another topic, if you're really interested in the intersection of IoT and financial services, um, Matt will be coming and doing a um, webinar on March 29th. So I encourage you to check our website um, for all the upcoming webinars. I am constantly updating that. So um, please check back at gridgain.com. Um, Alisa, that, there's, also, there's also an April a webinar on uh, payments, uh, I believe, uh, middle of April. That's correct. April 12th, um, yep. Eric and Matt mm -hmm. will be back to talk about payment yep. solutions. So like I said, um, we're trying to keep our customers in the financial services industry well informed with current trends and how we're addressing them and talking about use cases and, and um, case studies. So um, again, I encourage you to go to gridgain.com and take a look at the upcoming um, schedule for webinars, pretty robust. Okay, um, there are no other questions. So guys, thank you so much for, for the joint webinar and audience, thank you so much for attending today's session. We hope to see you in the future. Thank you again, Matt and Eric. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Bye.